Hi guys, welcome back to the tutorial here. I'm just going to continue on the exact same bit I left off with video 1. And it's only a couple of minutes after I finished the last one. I had a quick drink, I had a quick vape, and I'm uh, jumping back into it. So, what do you do after you've got your basic resources? This is where your own personal play will come into it. Um, first things first, I recommend building more residences. As you saw, our count was dangerously low for a minute or two there. So, a couple more residences puts can't hurt you. You do want to stay relatively close to zero so that you have a lot of residents working and you'll be as efficient as possible. But it's very easy to forget um, to build residences. It's one of the first things you'll do. And you'll quickly build a massive um, shortage of carriers. The buildings will have too many resources that aren't being delivered and they'll get full. Then people don't work. And even then, when you build the residences to deal with the shortage of carriers, because there's a backlog of jobs, you then have to wait ages before they've done the backlog to catch up with themselves again. And then during that time you've built too many residences, so then you have a hundred more residences than you this actually need because they've been today. catching up on the jobs. And those resources that you use for the residences could have been better built, better spent building other buildings. So as a general rule, keep an eye on that free set the count. Do not let, let it get too close Just to zero. More if you can see it's touching zero a couple of times when you're selecting new buildings and that kind of thing. You want to start building residences as a priority. If you can stick to having today. at least 15, 20 carriers free at a time, you can't go too wrong. Um, bear in mind that the further the buildings are away from your warehouse, the longer that carrier is going to take to do one job. So he's got to carry the wood. He's got to walk all the way up here, pick up the wood, then carry it all the way back. And that's going to take time. So, as you get along, it might not be that you don't have enough free settlers for the job. It might just be that they're having to walk a long way to do one job, so less efficient. You know, walking between here and here is going to be really quick. So, just bear that in mind that if you build further away from where your main warehouse is, it'll take longer to come back. You can build a warehouse on your settlement. You can build more warehouses. And they will transport goods to that warehouse and then use those or put them in their storage quicker. In general, I don't like building multiple warehouses because what you tend to find is your settlers constantly want to try and balance out the warehouses so that you have an equal amount of goods in all warehouses. If you build another warehouse here and another warehouse over here for the two production bits that are at either side, Excuse me. you'll find that all the planks will be transported, some there, some here, some there. Those carriers and then moving goods that you might not need, if you finish building over here and you no longer need to build buildings, they'll still bring the planks, but you don't need them anymore. you finish finished building over here, you want them all in this warehouse, but all warehouses will share all of their resources. So your set this will carry on trying to split it up. If this one has 30 in, this one has 30 in, and this one has 20 in, they're going to try and even out. They'll take five from this one, they'll take five from this one, and bring them all over to here. So again, you're, you're wasting carriers doing jobs. At least if you have one warehouse, all the goods are in there. Yes, they've got to walk it to where it's got to go, but it's all coming from the same place. Once it's delivered, that's it. Job's done. So, in general, I don't recommend building more than one warehouse. The one exception you might have is if your harbour is far away from where your warehouse is. And it might be better to build another warehouse close to your harbour, say if there was a harbour here. Because then it's a quick, quick access to sell those goods, put them on a ship and sell them. Um, which will be more beneficial for you. I think I mentioned in the last video, if your warehouse gets destroyed, it's game over. If you lose all your engineers, it's not game over, but it, it will be because you, you're stuck. You can't do anything. Um, 
you have to rely on what's already been built. The aim of the game is to destroy other players' warehouses. If um, if you build another warehouse, say here, you can destroy this warehouse because you still have a warehouse alive. So that's perfectly fine. If we were to destroy this warehouse ourselves, we'd instantly lose the game because that warehouse is gone. So do be careful with that. If the enemy destroys this warehouse, you will not lose the game because this warehouse is still alive. So it may be worth you building a warehouse just to keep yourself safe if you've got better defences around one. Um, or say your army is on the other side of the map and um, this warehouse is under attack and you know you've got defences here. You know, you can let this one be destroyed, give you a chance, your army chance to come back, and you've got another way of living. Um, but what a beautiful day. if you do manage to lose a warehouse, it's it's not great. Um, it will screw you over. And um, by the time they come to the warehouse, they've already destroyed half your base. So yeah, it's it's not good if you lose a warehouse. It's definitely recoverable, but chances are you won't. Anyway. Um, that's covered that. We've now got more residents, so we've got 33 free settlers. If you are of the Russian kind, you like to build an army as quick as possible. At this point, you'd probably be looking at building an army, getting your research done. We'll build that building just because I've got loads of hammer spare, so that's sorted. Again, I like a stone path for the research, just because it's quicker. You can do whatever you want. Um, so, food tab I've explained a little bit. This is all your food, which is used for boosting or whatever. Um, I think it's exclusively boosting. There's some research aspects as well that are selling. Um, people will still work without food. Don't ask me why. Um, you know, you don't have to give the thumb of fish, you don't have to give the tool maker berries. And you don't have to give miners food. If you give them food, however, they are a lot more efficient because they're happier and full and whatever. So, there's our two coal mines. As long as one of the hexes is on the spot of the resource, it will mine it. And then our iron mine, we can go here. And then just to make life simple, we'll put the iron mine here. As you can see, these are all the entrances, so we'll connect that, connect that, connect that, and then build the path back to our original one. As you saw, I built the path earlier just to save a little bit of time. Um, but there you go. Our settlers will carry the goods, and then our engineers will build it. As you can see, our three settlers is quite a low down, it's only on five at the moment. That's because we're carrying goods to four different building sites. So that will use a lot. As soon as the settlers start building it as well, this is settlers will prepare for that role. So these two are miners are ready to, oh, to work, so they're no longer free settlers. As you can see, our settler free count is going back up again. Because we're using a fair few again um, in four mines, I'm going to build another three residences. Again, just to keep up with that residence, is make sure you have the free settlers. It's important that every couple of buildings or so, you remember to build some residences. Make sure that you've got the free settlers to carry those goods. So, this is our academy. And you have three different pages. Protection and crafting is on every single academy. This last one can be toggled over to three different groups. And each one can specialise in administration, citizens or engineering. In general, I like citizens first. It only uses wooden logs, which are quite easy to get. And hammers, which again, you should be producing pretty quickly. I like to unlock this as early as possible. You don't have to unlock it as the first piece of research, you do have other stuff you can do. But, Citizens is important because that's the research that allows you to do the dirt road carts, the pool carts, the, the free goods per go, without building the stone road. So, that's why I like to go through first, because it makes your whole 
base and economy just much more efficient. You could use this. Um, each one will tell you what it does. As you do the first row here, just one of these two on each bit, you unlock the next row. And as long as you have the goods for that, you'll then be able to unlock that research. First one here is 15 health to our military units, which means those archers would have 15% more health. But we need 6 wheat. We haven't built a farm yet, so we don't have any wheat. This one is plus 3 vision range, which will give our military units a bit more range in how far they see into the fog and mist. Which is what you class this as, where you can't see what's there. If there was an enemy here, we wouldn't be able to see them. Fog of War, oh, something a lot of gamers will be used to. You can see further into that. Um, we have claiming territory is one second faster. So when they're expanding your borders, they'll be one second faster when they do it. So they'll move that block out by one hex, one second faster. And then we've got movement for our engineers, so they'll be 25% faster when they move. They'll also get an additional 20 health. So they can stand up to a few more attacks because engineers are very weak. They take like three hits and they're dead. So um, they don't have a lot of health. So this just makes them a bit more sturdy. And they're a little bit faster so they can run away better. Um, and that costs three hammers, which we, again we do have. Um, I will do the citizens one just to make my life easier. Um, but you should pick whatever you think would benefit you the most. Engineer speed is a good one because the faster you can get to stuff you want to build, the faster it's built, the faster you can produce that resource. Um, and health can't be too bad as well if you're, you know, building army pretty quickly like we're going to try here. Delivery coming through. So we have our two coal mines and we have our two iron mines. These guys will pump out iron and coal just fine. Do we want to boost them? As you know, boosting makes things a lot more efficient. The faster you can boost the resource, the more times two you're going to have for longer. Can only benefit you in the long run. This needs to be delivered right now. You could make an argument that rather than build the food chain that would feed both these guys, it'd be better just to capitalise on what they're making now and get your weapon production sorted quicker. Nothing Again, perfectly good. fine. Or you can do food first, so you're more efficient quicker then focus on producing the weapons when you know you're pumping out that coal and iron as fast as you can we're on sandbox mode so i'm going to show food first just because it's more um you're going to need to know how to boost these guys and um, first of all though i am mine to use berries so as you know we're already boosting our toolsmith uh, we're not boosting our toolsmith we should be boosting it but i forgot to press the button <laughs> so, as you know, we are now boosting our toolsmith, so we're already using berries for that. We do have three berry huts, however, and in general, a good minute is the general rule, I think. So, um, these guys will use a berry a minute to boost, these guys will pick up a berry a minute. We should be able to boost three buildings with berries um, and use all our berries. So, for our two iron mines, if we boost that one and we boost this one, and we boost the tool maker. We use some free berries and we're picking free berries. Life's good. Me. You can press R2 on PlayStation to swap between the two buildings. So if you know you've got enough for that type, you don't need to come off it, select the other one, press square. You can just press R2 to swap between them and press square whenever you want. If you want to unboost the building, just press square and they'll no longer deliver goods. Just bear in mind that any goods that have already been delivered won't be used unless you're pressing square to boost that building. So if we turn off our sawmill now, those two fish will be sat in the building and not be used. Um, they don't stay boosted until the resource is gone. They will only boost while that resource is turned on to use. So you could have three fish sat in there and not doing anything. Because you said don't boost the production. Um, rather than them using that free fish and not getting any more fish delivered. Um, 
The reason you might want to stop reboosting this is because, say, I wanted to be stone now rather than wood. I could turn off the woodcutter and the two woodcutters in the sawmill and only boost my stone mines and use the fish for that instead. As you know, we only have three fishermen, so we can't boost everything. So we, we can pick and choose when we need things. We've got over 135 stone and 177 planks, so we're not in desperate need of basic resources, but if we were, we could boost whatever we felt like we needed the most. As you can see, those guys have put down all the trees. They've been very, very happy. So now they're gone, and all this land is ready for, for development. Just because we can, we might as well build another woodcutter here and another woodcutter here and take advantage of these temporary trees over this way um, and once again just connect it back and I'm going to tell these guys to expand here. Our coal mine will use bread. I would have mentioned wheat so if any of you are familiar with how you make bread you know it's flour and water and flour comes from wheat so we have our farm and it's quite a chunky building so we'll need more space for this one um, but there's fine can't quite fit enough one in without destroying paths um, we can if we do it that way there we go. And again make sure that that's connected to a path you can simplify the path here and have it all split so they can walk around, but it's not really necessary. Just one in and out thing would be fine there. And let's have a look at this guy. So he uses water to grow wheat. So this guy uses water. A building we have is a well, and it takes up one hex. That will dig into the earth, get you buckets of water. You bring the water to the farm, they can then grow their crops. Simple as that. So we'll build two wells here for our two farms. I think the well is a little bit more efficient than the wheat farm. Um, so two wells will produce too much water. But you do need water further down the line for a bakery. So it doesn't really matter if we build the second well now when we don't need it. We'll just have an excess of water in there warehouse. The warehouse can only hold a maximum of each good. This blue bar shows you how full it is. So as you can see we're quite full on planks, quite full on fish, quite full on berries. So you know we, we are hitting capacity but in general in a game it's very hard to hit that capacity of the first warehouse. Uh, the only reason we are is because we're not being very efficient with our time here. So, we've got our two farms, they will produce wheat. We next need to build our next building along, which is the windmill. And that will turn our wheat into flour. In general, two farms is more than enough to do one windmill. And that works well there. Again, I'm keeping them together just to simplify the, the path the carriers make here. But our windmill will turn those two pieces of wheat into two pieces of flour and then if we go to our bakery our bakery will turn those two pieces of flour into a two piece of bread like this again remember to cut that off so two wheat farms for one windmill for two bakeries the windmill is efficient so we only need one Otherwise, it's one farm, one windmill, one bakery. Again, because the windmill is efficient, we've got two, wind two farms, one windmill, and two bakeries. Now, with this, I'm going to build another well. So we have three wells to our two farms and our two bakeries. Three wells should produce enough water for four buildings and do it that way. Now that we've got our bread production, we can go ahead and boost our coal mines. Now we don't actually have any bread yet, so they're not going to be boosted until the buildings are built and producing that bread. But by saying boost it, as soon as that bread becomes when available, it will go to the coal mine and we'll, we'll gain coal. 
One of the other buildings you have on your mining is the Charring Kiln. This was introduced last update 1.04. This will turn logs into charcoal, which for all intensive purposes acts just like coal, and even appears as coal, so that you don't have two separate piles of resource. Um, essentially, it will turn logs into coal, and then you have more coal. So, that's just... Yeah, any spare logs, um, if you're full on planks and your woodcutters have, have filled up your plank, your logs, you can use the spare logs to gain charcoal or coal. It's good for late game when you've already built everything, you know, rather than waste time turning logs into planks and then not using the planks or setting the planks. You can just use the logs for extra coal. And we're boosting our iron, so the extra coal will come in handy just to turn extra I iron into things. iron ingots or steel ingots. So we'll let our food production get started here, and we'll wait for the coal to get boosted. As you can see, the iron ore mines are boosted, they've got those particles around them. So they're producing two iron at a time, we're producing plenty of iron. These goods? Heavy. The village is growing. <sighs> Just one more delivery. This is my easiest job today. As you can see, these guys are planting and harvesting pretty quickly here. This isn't heavy at all. We got the water there as well. This is my easiest job today. There we go. That's one section harvested. There's the rolled up hay, or the wheat, and there, uh, he'll drop that down and be collected by one of the, uh, one of the carriers there. Excuse me. He watered the ground, now he's spraying the seeds, and the guy moves along to cut down more of the bushels. This isn't heavy at all. And there, uh, as you can see, the well guys just spin the wheel, get the book of the water off. That gets collected. With the baker, Excuse me. he will go in the little hut and uh, bring out a loaf of bread. So, yeah, that one's quite simple as well. This guy I just spins around and turns it into flour, as you'll see here in a second. These goods are heavy. This is my easiest job today. And yeah, you will hear your settlers comment on what they're doing. go, as you saw, a bag of flour just poured this out of that machine. Tool. He puts it down, and they said they will collect that and bring it to our bakery. This isn't heavy at all. That's our charring kiln. So as you can see, they've brought logs. They'll place logs in there and then bring out charcoal. Heavy. So we should be able to grab both of these animations here. This field is huge. There you go. As you saw, boil it out of the hook. So yeah, that's nice and simple Just process. One more delivery. Here comes the flower. Hey, careful with that sickle. There you go. So the bakery has now got his flower. Let the guys are like, come on. This isn't heavy at all. Yeah, there we go. This isn't Turn that heavy down. <laughs> roll it all out into a piece of bread. Excuse me. This needs to be delivered right now. Put on the little thing. Pop it in the oven. Wait for it to cook. Ah, 
And there we go. That's a piece of bread. That's it. Two pieces of bread there. Just one more delivery. From two bags of flour. And that will deliver to the coal people and they'll, they'll then harvest it. As you can see, our settlers are flashing zero at us because we've been creating loads and loads of jobs, but we haven't really been increasing our, our carrier count. So let's take care of that. As I said, very easy to forget about free carriers. Um, we really don't have an excuse because we've got loads of resources, so let's get that done. While we're on the subject of um, free carriers and, and engineers and that kind of thing, as you can see they're all going off to go to the jobs now. What you want to do if you want more engineers, with all the stuff that hammers are used, you have this building called the Guild Hall, which will recruit engineers as well as rangers, which are like spies. They are a military unit but not very strong, they're mostly used for scouting. Um, or scout. And I'll show you how to get them as well in just a second. And I'll just grab another um, farm here, just with some spare wheat, so I can show you the purpose of scouts. And yeah, we're going to have no free set this for a while because I've just told them all to bring a ton of resources, so we'll wait for them to do that. Just one more delivery. Yeah, that'd be fine. If you try and build, um, say here, it won't let you because you're blocking a resource. So you'd have to build it on this one. As it is, this one's not buildable upon, actually. Um, but yeah, say this one, for example. So as you can see, we can build the path out this way. But if we try and build on this one, because we're blocking the node oh, here, it won't let us build there. Um, because you won't be able to connect a path to anything you built at this spot. So you'd have to build where you can and then put the path there. There is a way to get past that little um, caveat there, but I'm not going to show that in the, in the basic tutorial. So yeah, I'll give my engineers loads and loads of jobs to do. And uh, we'll let them catch up. There's plenty of fish in the sea. We should go to the training ground someday. Now that we've unlocked the paid citizens as well, we'll move down that. So we'll use seven planks for this research. Which, when we make a building, we'll claim two more hexes of territory when we put it down. Marrow does have a big boost to what space is occupied when you build something. It just means your engineers have to claim less land as you build near your borders. Um, and this boosts that, so we'll accept that. As you can see, now that we've chosen citizens as expanded band, we can't see the other pages of the additional research. We're stuck with the citizens one. If we want access to the other two pages, we can build another two academies. And again, academy is very important to start as quick as possible. It takes time and resources to go through all of these different bits this of research you can do. Um, these bottom ones are the most powerful and the top ones are the most weak. But they're all incredibly useful for making your base or whatever a lot stronger. So as you can see, our settler count is now 171 out of 203, and it's taken time for them to make new new people. That's taken a minute. You can boost it with bread. This early on, though, it's just a waste of bread, so don't worry too much about that. We'll increase our engineer speed, because why not? As you can see, these guys are full, and that's because we had no free settlers to take the goods out of them. So we weren't being very efficient there because we were losing time on them collecting goods. So very informative. These guys are also finished with the stone deposits, so we'll get rid of them because there's no point having four settlers do nothing. 
donkey carts will go and rest in weird places. They only really work when a building has eight resources and they're moving no because their capacity needed. is eight. So don't expect them That's to do the odd job here and there. They'll only really come into play when you're moving eight. And while they're not working, they'll just wander off and go chill somewhere. So yeah, a bit, bit weird in that sense. But never mind. You know, this one, these two at least have stuck close by to the actual warehouse in case they're needed. This one's just gone a little wonder. Which they do do. Generally, your free settlers will stick around your base or around your buildings, ready for when there is a job available. This one. Okay, so 12 free settlers, so that's gaining. Um, we're now out of 252. So we're getting very, very busy here. More and more people are doing jobs. As you can see, there's small little queues here and there where they have to stop to let people pass. So we're, we are losing a little bit of time on that as well because we're so busy. Again, you can build another warehouse that may help mitigate those queues, depending on where they're building the goods from. But in general, I don't like that. So we do want to start looking at doing this research. Oh, if we have a look, you need 5 iron or steel bars and you need 13 planks. Before that, we need to do this one, which requires potions or requires 200 gold coins. So, we'll address the iron bars first because we have our iron and coal production. So, what are we doing with that basic resource? This We're putting it into a furnace. Turns coal and iron into this bars. Iron bars or steel bars, whichever you think it is. We'll place that there, again next to the coal and iron, so it can just transport it there. Any spares will go back here, then back again. But in general, building it close by where it's needed will mean they'll bring it from there to there. This is my easiest job today. And we also have our blacksmith, which will use coal and iron bars and turn them into our weapons. So we might as well build that at the same time. Then, what are we doing with those weapons? We need to train soldiers. So if we go onto our military tab, we can see our training grounds. And that will turn our weapons, as well as the settler, into a warrior. So that's our army production now sorted. We're also boosting these as well, so we're producing more than we actually need. As you can see, we've got 104, 105 coal, 108 iron spare. So we could potentially build another furnace, which you definitely want to do. Like this. And another blacksmith. Like this. And now, whatever coal and iron we produce, we should now use between the four buildings here. For a training ground, two weaponsmiths will supply one training ground quite comfortably. You can train up to, I think it's 12 um, soldiers at a time. Um, or you can turn on auto and just automatically recruit. That's fine as well. Now, our furnace can also be boosted. Again, a lot of buildings that can be increase the production. And our furnace needs meat. You have two possible ways to get meat. You have this building called a ranch, which will use wheat and water to feed a cow or whatever's in there. Um, buffalo, maybe. Um, and they'll grow the buffalo, butcher the buffalo, and, you know, give you meat. So that's there. We've, we know we've got a spare farm here, so we know we're going to produce the wheat to give to it. In general, ranches will use a lot of wheat, so it might be worthwhile getting another farm, just so that we know there's enough wheat to feed the uh, buffalo there. Bear in mind we now have four farms and a ranch, so our three wells might not be enough to keep up. So we may want to build another well, just again, to make sure that we're producing enough water all of those buildings as you can see we're still going up but that may change so we're just covering our basics here 
No, I said there was two ways of gaining meat, and there is, and this map does have an example of that. So over here, we have a hunting ground, which is currently regrowing population, and there are seven meat available. What this that means is there are seven thought. animals nearby, and there's this another one. food building we'll called a hunter's nice cabin, who will hunt deer and then supply meat through the deer. Every hunter's hut will, in general, do two meat at a time. So, for the seven meat that's available, four hunter's cabins will be perfectly enough. And they'll they'll keep that population of deer down and supply us with a, steady, a steady stream of meat. As you can see, it's gone down to five because I put the, the hunting grounds in the territory. If you can build a little bit further away, that will have a higher number. But I'm not really fussed about being efficient. Plus, some of these deer will wander outside, and we haven't quite expanded everywhere yet, so some of them will escape in that Where sense. Can I help? Um, in fact, we'll go grab that land for now, just to get that out of the way with. And I'll show you about engineers quickly as well. So, engineers or ranger, engineers can be clicked on there. They'll bring a hammer and they'll train to be an engineer. Uh, Ranger, again, very weak. Um, they have like a blowgun to attack with. They're not very strong whatsoever. We'll recruit one just to have to show you what it does. These goods are... For now, let's boost our furnace, let's boost our blacksmith. And uh, show you our two. And boost that one. And boost that one. Boost these as well. One ranch per building. Uh, one hunter's ground per building. There's four hunter's cabins that should supply all four of these with enough. And we've got the ranchers back up, so we should be producing enough meat to keep these boosted all the time as well. There we go. So that is our ranger. Again, a very weak unit. But he does have several advantages. So, when stood still, the ranger will effectively turn invisible. He can't be seen by the enemy. Unless the enemy comes close to him, in which case he will turn visible. So, you know. Not a very good idea to let them wander close to where the ranger is if you put him on a path. However, if you hid him in some trees or something next to a path, he can use what he can see and report back to you to let you know what's coming. So if I tucked him here, for example, and the enemy walked here, then might not trigger him. He would see them coming closer. We could then move our troops to respond and send them to, to deal with the threat. As you can see, due to his vision, he is expanding what we can see. Enemy in sight. And we found some enemy, okay. Watching. So if these guys came here, they would see him. For now, he'll be invisible. You can see he's sort of blending in there. Now he does have an ability. On PlayStation, if you press L2, you've got the recall button, which is available for any unit you can select. You've also got this crow's eyes, which will reveal a part of the map. Press X to select that, and you can view what's in this circle. It's best to use it where you can't currently see. So if I press X here, Enemy in sight. and you see the little crows, and they will tell us what's in that area, so we can see there is enemy in this little circle that we've revealed. This doesn't last forever, but it's good if you want to check, you know, where your arm is going to see what's available. Again. These guys will not stand up to attack, so it is not worth sending an army of these into battle. They will not last. I can find the path. Um, their health is, is okay, but what the damage is a bit small, so they, they will not do anything. As you can see, as soon as we're moving, he will move into battle. In this case, we'll send him to attack. And you can see just how long he lasts there. So I think, I think he got maybe one hit off. 
He he does have poison, so it will affect enemies a little bit uh, with like a damage over time. But again, the damage is so low. They're not a good army. They're better used for scouting, keeping an eye on what's going on, or just as a pre-alert system to let you know when an enemy is coming your way. Um, there is a new spell as well, um, spell or gadget, I should say, um, which is the smoke screen, which will hide a unit if they're stood still. A bit like what he does, where he blends in. However, if a scout is near a enemy that has been smoke screened it will show you where they are so they are good in that sense if you think an enemy could be hiding an army somewhere close by it's a good idea to to send a, a scout there first now as you can see I completely forgot to connect these up because that building was in the way and I somehow thought they were connected so we're just going to connect that to this path here and then that'll be that connected. We can also do this just to make that path a, one more hex more effective at the transport and we can get rid of the old path there. There you go. So now our hunters grounds will supply us with meat. These guys will be boosted as you can see the weapon myth is boosted. A furnace will produce two iron bars per one coal and one iron and a weapon smith will produce two weapons per iron bar and one piece of coal so you know producing twice the amount of weapons every minute is obviously a massive advantage so you do want to boost it as quick as possible this is our uh, training ground so let's look at this as you can see trains carry out with weapons to become a soldier at the moment the blacksmith will always start on the shield, so we're producing shields. We can just press this to recruit um, basic shield maidens or whatever you call them. Uh, guardians in this sense, but yeah. Our carriers will bring the shields to the training grounds. Then they'll occupy one of the dummies here and train. As you can see, this when they first start training, right they really aren't very effective, you know. Um, and then as they train a bit more, they get a bit more and more efficient with it. And then, poof, training is complete. And we now have a shield user. Ready for duty. And this will train as many as you've selected. The carriers will bring them over and just keep pressing next to recruit them once they've been trained. Keep that queue busy. If you press triangle, you can create an automatic recruitment, but bear in mind that they'll only fill these five slots, so you'll only train five at a time. Five at a time. There are six training posts available, so you can train up to six at a time, with four standing outside ready to be recruited. So in general, you can keep on auto, but if you've got the spare resource, I do recommend pressing X, filling that queue completely, because you know your setters are on the way with the goods. I'm just going to turn that off for now, so we don't overextend. But these guys are now selectable, and you can move it to your defense, and you have a very small army here. I haven't mentioned it yet, but there is also this thing called a rally point, which will change where those soldiers spawn when they come out. So if I move the spawn point to over here, Ready for grab the one that's already done, and this guy that's currently training, when he's finished his training, rather than walk outside and stand in this area, he will walk over to here. So you can change the flag to where your towers are, where your fences are, and the the soldiers will then gather at that point rather than you have to move them manually from wherever your training ground is. Um, in this case I think he was trained afterwards so he's running there automatically but just as proof you there you go that guy's on his way so will that guy so will that guy so will these guys so yeah they're gonna make their own way over there 
I'm going to change these two to archers, just to show you them as well, and then we'll do axemen. Um, so yeah, our weapon production is running fantastic. I did say I wanted to show you about this as well, so as I said I need iron bars, I also need planks. Again, we've still got the previous level to do. So now that we've got basic defense sorted with warriors, um, we can focus on other things, right? Not quite. So, we've spent an hour and 43 minutes and 10 seconds getting to our first 20 units. We have 22 in total. Uh, 21. Okay, so there's 21 here, and this makes 22. We took an hour and 43 minutes to get 22 units of defense. That's not going to cut it. Bear in mind that. I've been talking the whole time, so yeah, I would normally have way more by now. But we're on 23 units, and another another player could have already built their entire base and an army of 300 by now, and they'd be coming for us. We'd be absolutely screwed. So you can rely on your actual army as defense. If the army was trying to march in, you can meet them in battle. If you won, you've defended, fantastic. If not, you are screwed. So what else can we do for defense? In our military tab, we also have towers. We have a bastion, and we have a tower. Yeah, don't know why they're both towers, but never mind. The <coughs> red tower is an area effect tower. Where that ring is, it will hurt enemies within that ring. With like a rain of fire where everyone like fires fire arrows out. And an occasional blast of damage that will hurt an enemy. Take it easy. We also have a green tower which will heal within that circle of effect. And again, blast an enemy. The green tower and the red tower both have a straightforward attack that deals a lot of damage to one unit. <laughs> The red tower is weaker than the green tower. The green tower can one hit kill most enemies with that single attack. The red tower will usually take two, three hits to do that. Um, so the green tower in general is better for singular units. The red tower, due to that area of effect power that it has, is more effective when there's more than one unit and it's dealing damage to multiple units at once. You also have this thing called a decoy, which I will also place in front of my towers like this. If there is a decoy and an enemy walks close by to it, it will taunt an enemy unit. And rather than attacking your tower or your troops, they'll attack the decoy. Now, the decoy, the red tower and the green tower, even if I select them in the wrong order there, have a cooldown on their abilities. As I said, the green tower can heal. It can heal your nearby units. It can also heal itself. So if the green tower gets low on health, it can heal itself and the area. And then take another punishment. Um, the red tower has their effect. Oh, that's got its taunt. With the cooldown, you can choose to auto it. So if an enemy comes to a range, you can activate the tower automatically, or you can set it to manual. For the computer, automatic is fine. If the enemy is coming into your base, they will attack the tower. Auto will defend you. You're good. As you can see, that ring is going round and round, show that it's on auto. If you're on PvP, I would turn auto cast off. The reason for that is the enemy can send one or two people in, do, activate the tower, done. and then when the area effect has run out, they can then attack without being damaged by it. As you can see, this doesn't affect your own unit, so we're safe. So, you know, you've, you've wasted that ability and you have to wait for it to recharge. The ability doesn't last the whole of that timer. That's just how long it's going to take before it comes back again. So as you can see, it's about a third of the way done when it starts to turn off. This is so at this point, that tower will be under attack, and we could only hurt one person at a time. 
This tower has healing. I don't think you need to turn this on manual. The only problem you might have with this one is it might automatically try and heal troops rather than healing itself. And the tower is the stronger unit here. The tower can deal more damage and kill more people than a small safe. army would. But in general, you can leave the green one on auto and you'll be fine. Same with the decoy. If you're against a computer, auto is fine. Auto is brilliant. It will taunt up to 10 enemies on the basic level of the decoy without any research. 10 units with stuck attacking that, which has a tremendous amount of health. Decoys are made out of stone and they are very, very hard to destroy. Um, so they will take a beating. They will you know, keep the enemy occupied for quite a while. This is a good and while they're attacking that, you can attack them and you know, mess the army up. However, again, it is on auto. So it will only force the enemies to attack for a certain amount of time. Again, part of that radius. This isn't heavy at all. As you can see, sucking them in. If they sent one enemy within range, the taunt would activate. The one guy would be stuck attacking. Then once that wave stops and they're no longer being forced to attack the decoy, they could send the rest of the army in and attack your towers. Again, the best play here, if I was attacking this sort of setup. Um, once I've got the army over here, would be to grab, say, like... Um, no, not even that many. No. Any orders? Yeah, this would do. Ready I'd grab serve. these three and I'd say go the attack. Right here. Um, here. These three would run in. This would activate. This would activate. This wouldn't. Both those would activate, so you'd have the ring of fire, and they'd be stuck attacking the decoy. And then as soon as those Any three orders? died or the effect had run out, I'd grab the rest Any of the protect? army and tell them to go attack. And with no decoys stuck in the attacks, I could say, go attack the tower straight away. They'd attack the tower, hurt it, and the tower would, would be destroyed without doing this ring of fire and killing all of the soldiers. Obviously, it's my own tower, so it's a bit hard to show you the, One day, the attack here, but see my family again. yeah, it would, it would do nothing. Um, so, as you can see, the ring shows the range of the attacks. This covers that, that covers that. There is a gap here, and an enemy would be expected to see that there's a sideways they can come in. So any bottlenecks you want to cover up completely. Shove another tower here. Shove another decoy there. Shove another decoy. Oh, I did it. Um, you got two decoys there. Another decoy here. No matter which avenue they attack, they're going to be in trouble. This is still the weaker side, because this tower is covering a bigger area, as you can see. But... That's just my bad planning on where I put the towers. You could space them out better. Or again, just build more towers. As long as the tower has at least one hex between them, you can create more towers. So you could do something like this. And just build an absolute wall of towers for them to get through. And if you have the 10 or 9 towers like this, even an army of like 150 is going to struggle getting through. Especially with the decoys there as well, you can put more decoys in the gap. So one, two, three, four here. This would be hell. Trying to get through this with just normal warriors would be an absolute disaster. Um, that's it. You can then produce your army, go attack them, have a good time. They're throwing themselves at the walls and just dying in, in large numbers here. Um. So yeah, that's your basic defense, either a big enough army that you've got more than the enemy, so even if they attack you, they lose, or you've got a wall of towers and you're, you're set. Now, the reason we're building this many is because we've got a hell of a lot of resources, which apparently is causing queues, because um, it's a lot of resources to try and deliver. Um, Normally in game you would not have the resources spare to build 10 towers at once So I recommend building one and a decoy in a main path dead center So no matter which way they attack they're gonna get sucked in by that tower or the decoy 
that's your basic defense. Once you get further along in the game, you can reinforce that tower with army or build more towers to help alleviate the damage that an enemy could do if they tried to slip down the gaps and that kind of thing. Uh, we need more residences again, so let's get that done. Excuse me. Excuse me. This isn't heavy at all. Um, I think job today. that would do. Yeah, let's just build another one. Ah, we're actually running out of stone. Okay, interesting. Too long chatting. We do, however, have nearly maximum fish, anyone. so we can boost our stone mines now. And we're not short on planks, so we, we, can, we can boost that fine. So yeah, we're going to build an absolute wall here. And nothing's going to come through that, at least for now. I'll explain in the next video, um, or further down the line, what could get through these towers and why building a wall of towers isn't going to save you. Um, but for the basics, this this is hell. If I had an army of 200, I would not want to try and get through this. An army of 300 would struggle as well, to be fair. Um, so yeah, I, I would be looking at this and thinking, yeah, don't want to look at that. I'd maybe try the other side and try and attack from this side of things. Just in case, like here, there's no defences on this side. So, keep an eye on where you can be attacked. It's no good building all these towers here. If they can just walk in the back door and take you out. Especially since this is where your armor production is. If they came in and attacked this, and then say, yeah, ally came and saved you. Your army production's gone, you're then weak for another 20 or 30 minutes while you rebuild an army back up. So, yeah, build towers equally. Make sure you're covering all the entrances and exits. Try and reinforce with army, but in general, towers are a good bet. With a decoy, do not forget the decoy. Because you could walk an army past the tower, yes, you'd lose three or four people, but you could walk past. The decoy forces you to stay in that position and keep getting hit by the tower. So you want the decoy paired with the tower at all times. We all work together here. So that's the army production. Um, I don't think I've showed you all the units yet, and I'll do that now. Let's change that to at. Change this to at. Where I made 63 bows. We've been really been kicking butt with the uh, production here. This guy cannot plant any more trees because they're full. And the woodcutters are full. So, everywhere's full. We've got no free settlers because they're all carrying goods to the towers and we sent them all on jobs. And yeah, we need more settlers. <laughs> so, yeah, bear with me, guys. I'll start another video and we'll move on to how to get through this um, in the next one. So, bear with me.